move on now to uh, Jack Graves. Jack um, is a professor at the Turo Law Center in New York. He teaches contracts, business law, arbitration, and also digital lawyering. This is the techn technology leveraged legal service delivery. So if he has his way, presumably put all of us out of business. Um, his um, most recent books, Learning Contracts, the ABCs of the CISG, and I have to confess, I have to remind you what CISG is. You'll all know it's a conventional international sale of goods, which is designed for business that has not got ahead with knowing what the current position is. Uh, I know of Toro uh, particularly because I think the head of your academic community at Toro is Hal Abramson, who I corresponded with on a variety of things to do with mediation. Um, so would you give me my very kind regards when you're next talking to him? Um, Jack, you'll be talking about bilateral arbitration treaty regime, maybe the answer for SMEs in small states. Thank you. Uh, you know, you started out uh, suggesting that this conference has some very unique features. Yeah. And I agree. I agree with everything you said. There's actually one other unique feature about this conference that I'd like to add. The subject that Gary talked about in his keynote, the idea of arbitration as a default, it's obviously a pretty new and revolutionary topic. In fact, to my knowledge, there are no more than six people in the world who have written or spoken on this topic. And uniquely, at least half are affiliated with this conference, uh, including me, Gary, Petra Butler. I don't know, is Campbell Herbert here? Uh, Campbell's not here. Okay, so your co-author. But the fact is, this is a pretty novel concept. You, most of you heard it from Gary earlier. And uh, when I heard who was here, I said, oh, I'd love to come contribute. So you're on, I, a ro you're on a road. What I didn't know, what I didn't know was that Gary was going to talk about it in his Kivo, keynote. And let's face it, Gary Bourne's a tough act to follow. Uh, so I, as I kind of got over that, okay, I'm going to deal with this, I thought, you know what, this is great because Gary introduced you to the basics in his keynote, and so I can have a little more fun with the nuances and working around the edges. So let's see if I can add something to what he's already talked to you about. I start out calling this a, 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 a conceptual foundation. We've got a confluence of ideas. I actually first talked about this five years ago at a conference in Missouri where, oddly enough, I met Gary for the first time. Uh, and, and the focus of that conference was court litigation over arbitration agreements. It's one of the, it's, I think the biggest single problem with arbitration is that parties start out with what they think is a single dispute on the merits of their, of their transaction, and they end up with two disputes, one over the transaction and one over did they agree to resolve it through arbitration. And they end up spending enormous amounts of money and really defeating the whole purpose of arbitration. And my position at that conference and with the paper I wrote was the reason it's such a problem is we have stood the default on its head. What we've got is we have a default that is the exception. Most international commercial parties who are well informed and understand the benefits of arbitration would choose arbitration. But our default is courts. So I suggested at that time, maybe we ought to change the rules. Gary came along about a year later and came up with a brilliant idea. I, initially, I just said, well, well, we'll do a treaty, but that's hard. Gary came along with this brilliant idea. Let's do it piece by piece with bilateral arbitration treaties, or BATS, uh, model on the idea of a bit. Brilliant idea. Now, the one thing, and Gary said this, but I want to emphasize it because I think it's really important. Conceptually, it's a little like a bit. But what's not like a bit is no, no government is, is ceding its sovereignty in, in agreeing to BATS. This is very different than BITS. I agree that the, the opposition to BITS today uh, around the world, including the United States where I come from, is misguided. But it's real. It has nothing to do with BATS. This is simply allowing business people to resolve their disputes in the way that works most efficiently. And then a couple of years later, uh, Petra and Campbell Herbert came along and said, you know, not only is this a great idea, this whole thing about BATS and, and arbitration as a default, but it is uniquely a great idea in the context of small to mid-sized enterprises, or I usually call them MSMEs, micro, small, and mid-sized enterprises, in a small state. This was near and dear to my own heart. I spent 17 years running small and mid-sized enterprises, many of them doing business globally, before I ever went to law school. So I come at this from the perspective of the business person who says, you know, if I'm engaged in contracts for half a million dollars here, half a million dollars there, and I'm crossing national borders, I can't enforce them. 
not without an arbitral regime. I certainly can't afford to enforce them in court. So again, that's why I'm a little passionate about this subject. Um, the, uh, so what I hope to do in my presentation is further elaborate on the unique value of a BAT to an SME, and then add something based on my current digital lawyering focus uh, on making the process easy, quick, and even more cost effective. We've heard a number of people talk about the cost of arbitration, and some of it is unavoidable. You're not paying judges who are paid by the tax. I mean, you don't have judges paid by the taxpayers. So you, have, you the litigant, or the, the parties subject to, uh, uh, to arbitration proceedings, have to pay the arbitrators. And, and that's costly. No way around it. On the other hand, there are a lot of costs incurred in arbitration that are unnecessary. And I'll talk about how maybe we can get rid of some of those. So a superior default rule. Uh, Gary really already talked about this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, the, uh, I, I, but I would add one other point. He talked about the fact that frequently small to mid parties, and in particular small to mid-sized enterprises, don't put a dispute resolution provision in their agreements. And often it's just oversight. But there's something else. And I can tell you this from personal experience. It's not just at the, the 11th hour. It's at the never hour. And the reason small businesses don't like to do this is it's bad form. You're talking about, you're negotiating an agreement. If you're a business person, you don't even want to admit that there's any possibility that anything will ever go wrong because it kind of suggests maybe you're not the kind of person I want to deal with. So a lot of business people consciously avoid talking about disputes, and for good reason. So again, I think in this context, the small to mid-sized enterprise where the parties are negotiating their own deal, not their lawyers, the default rule is crucial because that's often what they're going to end up with because by the time the dispute arises, they're not going to agree on arbitration. They're, Whatever the default is, that's what they got because they can no longer agree on anything. So should arbitration be the default rule? It's arguably the choice of a fully informed, of a fully informed party to cross-border trade. Again, Gary talked about these, as did, uh, the, as did uh, uh, my colleague on this panel. Neutral decision maker, efficient, objective, expert, and fully enforceable under the New York Convention. So again, I don't need to spend a lot of time on that. Um, so what about a framework? If, if we've got a default rule, OK, great, we're going to arbitrate. Under what rules? What, how do we do this? Fortunately, as Gary mentioned, we've already got a great set of rules for this purpose in the UNCTRAL arbitration rules. And moreover, we've actually got some experience with this. I don't know how many of some of you are from, from the, the Caribbean. Um, and, and, I'm a, and I know there's someone here from Mexico uh, that is a uh, signatory to the uh, Inter-American Convention on Arbitration. To the extent that, the, that you have two parties from the Americas who are members of the Inter-American Convention, it displaces the New York Convention for purposes of enforcement. And a little known fact is that if you have an arbitration agreement, bare bones, the parties agree to final, enforcing arbit final and enforceable arbitration and nothing else, no rules, no institution, nothing. If that agreement is governed by the Inter-American Convention, they get the UNCTRAL rules. It's actually the 1976 UNCTRAL rules, and it's under the auspices of the Organization of American States. But the point is, this idea of the UNCTRAL rules as a default, where the parties have simply agreed to arbitration, it's not new. It's been tested. In addition, we've got a vehicle for, you say, OK, we've got the UNCTRAL rules. We know the problem with arbitration under, the, uh, under ad hoc rules is what happens if we can't get a, cons a, a tribunal constituted? What happens if there's a challenge? The great thing about the UNCTRAL arbitration rules is they deal with that. You go to the, court per the, to the permanent court of arbitration. Gary suggests in his proposed bat that the permanent court be formally designated the appointing authority under the UNCTRAL rules. Once you've got a tribunal, most of the problems disappear. The real challenge with ad hoc arbitration is getting the tribunal appointed. So here, we've got a framework. If we want to make arbitration the default, the framework already works. We know how it works. Now, again, my suggestion when I first talked about this idea was a global convention. Hey, something like the New York Convention, great idea. But as we know, a number of people have talked to us. This has taken a long time to come around, and we know how slow things have been with the Hague Convention. I think Gary said, not in our lifetimes. 
I'm not sure if I'd go that far, but it's very slow. And you know what? It may well be that we don't see the United States a member of this convention in our lifetimes because of issues of what cooperative federalism, which I probably should not talk about. Anyway, uh, the real challenges, real challenges in getting the U.S. on board uh, for a lot of stupid reasons in my view, but, but it's still a challenge. So Gary comes up with this more modest and achievable approach, essentially bat by bat or map by map. And, and there are some real benefits to this on a, variety of, uh, on a variety of basis. For one, it's incremental. It allows it to grow. But the other thing it does is I think that, that taking this approach, taking the approach of bilateral or regional multilateral arbitration agreements or arbitration treaties, you can actually make the most out of the treaty itself. And so the benefits to a small state this directly facilitates trade between bat signatories. So if we, I think, uh, uh, if we've got uh, uh, New Zealand and Fiji, I'll just pick a couple of kind of, uh, negotiating a bilateral arbitration treaty. This directly facilitates trade between uh, New Zealand and Fiji, and the two countries each have a specific opportunity to promote the awareness within the business community and the benefits of arbitration in terms of dispute resolution. Again, we're not taking anything away from either country's sovereignty. What we're doing is we're fueling the development of trade. In addition, uh, as I think we, we all agree, that it'd be great if every country in the world was a signatory to the New York Convention, if you like arbitration, as I do, uh, but some aren't. And to the extent that for whatever reason a country isn't a New York Convention signatory, in a bilateral arbitration treaty, you can address the issue of enforcement directly in the treaty. Even if a country is a New York Convention signatory, you actually have the, the opportunity to address some new enforceability issues. I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but there are some real challenges to enforcement of the New York Convention based on a very kind of traditional view of the writing requirement. In fact, a much more strict writing requirement under Article II of the New York Convention than we find under the model law, either variation on Article Seven. So again, if you've got a new convention on arbitration, you can include enforcement and you can actually deal with some of the challenges of the New York Convention. Nobody's going to change the New York Convention. With 156 signatories, you don't want to go amending it. <coughs> So how about arbitration uh, as, uh, with respect to the small or mid-sized enterprise? Here's the scenario I like, pretty typical. You have a seller of goods from country A to a buyer in country B. Neither has any assets in the other's jurisdiction. And neither has any access, in effect lawyers, uh, to the uh, legal system in the other country. The buyer refuses to take and pay for the goods, presumably saying they're defective. Uh, the buyer says, no, they're not. What are the seller's options to try to enforce? Well, one of the possibilities is that the uh, seller can, of course, sue in its own country, courts of its own country. A. if the buyer is smart, the buyer just defaults, ignores it, because it's hard to enforce a fully adjudicated court judgment across national borders, but it's not impossible in some countries. It's virtually impossible in any country to enforce a default judgment across national borders. So you just ignore it. The other option is you sue in country B. And maybe you get a fair, fair deal, fair shake in the other's court. Maybe not. At the very least, you're going to spend a lot of money for lawyers who are able to practice in that court. And in, any, in either event or both, too often, the process is really slow. The process involves duplicative proceedings with added layers of counsel, specialty counsel, expensive. And in fact, it's expensive in a lot of, in, in a lot of manners. So, so you end up with something that is slow, cumbersome, and expensive, which is not great for any business. It's anathema for a small business. The practical effect is often a denial of any effective justice. A lot of people say, oh, I don't know about this idea of arbitration as default. You know, what, what about, you know, what about the, uh, right, uh, the uh, uh, right to access justice? Uh, I'm not sure our court systems always provide justice in this context. There's plenty of stories. We've all got our war stories. What about this question of consent? Uh, again, this is the real stumbling point. Arbitration, we've all, I teach arbitration. Uh, I, I, I'm fully familiar with all of Gary's materials. Everybody would tell you, Arbitration is a matter of consent. I think Gary, again, did most of the work on this. But first of all, particularly when I look at US law, 
the presumption of consent to arbitration is so great. I mean, we even bind consumers in the United States. Much of the world doesn't do that, consumers and employees. The presumption is so strong in overcoming a pathological arbitration clause, as Gary suggested. It's really not much of a leap to just say, you know what, most people want this, let's presume it. And then when you add a treaty, in fact, now we've got positive law and constructive consent. And again, I think Gary talked about this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But it's hard to, I, I, when I, co I compare this, for instance, to uh, FIFA arbitration, uh, when, an, when a, uh, a football player says, I'm going to play football, uh, you know what? His, his contract is subject to arbitration. He doesn't formally, it's part of the deal. It's part of the deal, and, and I think there is every bit as much consent here that when you have two people from two, from, from two countries who have agreed in the bat to arbitration, I think it's pretty easy to say they have consented Jack, to this. Jack, this is very unfair, but the tribunal is going to ask you just to pause, if you don't mind. Sure, um, no, no. Because one of our commentators, uh, Edwini Kisi, it has to leave at four. And I wonder whether you'd mind just popping up and giving me any commentary you'd like at this stage before you have to go? Because you, yeah. depends on when you have to go. Well, I, I think maybe in five minutes, uh, I'll leave about five minutes. Okay. Uh, continue. Let, let me see if I can Council get through it in five, five minutes. Uh, uh, no problem. Um, so uh, I'll see if I, so, and again, it's important to remember that the parties remain free to choose. And one other point, I've heard, I actually had an argument when Gary posted on the Clear Arbitration blog, posted his bat, I actually engaged in commentary argument with uh, Alan Scott Rao from Texas, who said, oh, no, no, arbitration is too complicated. The simplistic counsel of the small to mid-sized enterprise won't be able to handle it. I said, <laughs> arbitration isn't complicated. The only thing that's complicated about arbitration is competence, competence, and separability. And once it becomes the default, those disappear. The jurisdictional competence is derived from the background law, and we don't need separability anymore. The person who's choosing a court will need separability, but that's a whole separate issue. So the point is, arbitration doesn't need to be complicated. Access to justice is fundamental, but we don't need to rely exclusively on courts. We can get access, we can provide access through effective dispute resolution through arbitration and use courts for interim relief and enforcement. Together, they can provide an SME with true access to justice. Now, maximizing the value. The SME is, is uniquely sensitive to issues of cost, business disruption, and the need for quick resolution. All of these can be more fully realized through effective use of technology. Just almost exactly a year ago, it was actually June last year, uh, I'm on the uh, board of uh, Journal on Technology for International Arbitration. We held a mock arbitration using Cisco telepresence. And people were just, we did a, uh, one, one of my colleagues did a cross-examination. We had the examiner in one country, the, you know, people in, in lots of different places. It was fabulous. But it's also still pretty expensive. And one of our colleagues from Germany said, you know, this is great. We just saw the Porsche. But most people, particularly small businesses, they don't need the Porsche. The Volkswagen Beetle is perfectly good. So I call this desktop arbitration, crossing borders without leaving home. It's effective and affordable technology that will support real-time online arbitration in a manner that is just as effective as sitting around a conference table. It addresses many of the concerns of the typical SME. You, you eliminate arbitrator and witness travel time and expenses. The party business disruption is minimized. And think about how much easier it would be to schedule arbitration hearings if you only had to schedule every participant at his or her own desktop and not have everybody flying into a common location. Technology. This is, this is just a, a screenshot uh, of, uh, of, a, uh, of Adobe Connect and, and a, uh, a built-in piece of software for doing depositions, but you get the parties on video, you get your running transcript from real-time court reporting, you've got your exhibits, it's all right there. I do this sort of thing at home on a simple home computer. I actually teach online as well. Um, you've got all the electronics, and again, I, I don't have any stake in any of these companies, Opus 2 provides all of the uh, arbitral record instantaneously online, accessible instantly by the panel, by the claimants and respondents. I love Opus 2's graphic. This is on their website. They show everybody sitting around a, a conference table with all of the screens and all the information. They don't need to be around a conference table. They can be doing the same thing sitting at their own desktops. 
So technology in the bat. Um, if, we, if we believe this is a good idea and we'd like to save the people who are doing this uh, money, we can add a provision to Gary's bat that essentially allows the use of technology in all cases where the parties mutually agree. We make it aware, you know, proper technology will save the party's money is okay. And maybe even allowing either party to invoke the use of technology to avoid travel and costly expenses in cases under a specified amount. We've already got uh, expedited arbitration. Maybe this is further expedited and less expensive arbitration. In addition, you have the ability, in Gary's Article 6, Section 4, he talks about compliance with the New York Convention. We can further talk about compliance with the New York Convention's Articles 5.1b and 5.1d. So again, this is an opportunity not only to make arbitration the default, but to make it much less costly. And I had some other, so the SME ends up with effective and affordable access to justice. In the interest of time, I had some other slides, but I'm gonna bail out on those. They were ancillary points, so I'll stop there. Jack, thank you okay. very much. Another tour de force from arbitration to technology to, to sales. Would you like yeah. to? Yes, please. Well, I'll be very brief. Um, Just to explain, one other number of commentators we're going to look at, uh, ask to speak later on on all the resources. You have to leave early, so you have less first. That's the disadvantage of coming from Vanuatu. I have to go to Australia then. Anyway, I'll be very brief. My comments would relate to um, arbitration in the, um, in the Pacific, and I'd like to t um, thank the presenter. Clearly, um, just like the Caribbean, arbitration hasn't caught on in the Pacific. And I think, um, I think some of the reasons which were advanced earlier um, in the, for the Caribbean also apply equally to the Pacific. Now, in terms of cross-border trade, we also need to take into account the sort of trade. In fact, I was just looking um, at the trade statistics. Um, there was um, the Papua New Guinean minister complaining about some biosecurity issues. And he said that the two-way trade between Papua New Guinea and Fiji is something like $19 million. So relatively, you find that very little trade occurs. And as such, you can also understand, even in terms of the products, like in the context of the Pacific, the product that Fiji sells to other Pacific countries would be biscuits, you know, more consumer products. And they will sell through their own maybe outlets in the other Pacific Island countries. So the scope for disputes are quite limited. Having said that, though, I think there is the realization among Pacific Island countries that arbitration would be a good thing, and mainly because they like to attract investment, and they see arbitration as a tool for them to attract investment, given their developmental challenges. Um, the, I think it was quite clear from, we had two um, meetings on arbitration last year, one in Papua New Guinea, which was sponsored by Incitro, and the other, uh, Petras, and it was quite clear that there is a death of information on arbitration in the Pacific. In fact, in the meeting in Papua New Guinea, we had the head of the commercial division in Papua New Guinea, and he basically um, said that, well, there is limited information on arbitration, but he thinks that it should be the way to go going forward. So I think, as I had mentioned yesterday, in the context of the PESA Plus negotiation, I think it's a missed opportunity, um, but we just couldn't agree. For example, the Pacific Island countries have proposed that there should be a non-binding mediation. And as I had mentioned yesterday, Australia and New Zealand are a little bit not very supportive. I don't know the reasons why they are not very supportive about that proposal. It's still on the table, but my own guess is because of cost because the Pacific Island countries would expect Australia and New Zealand to pay for everything. So I think my own, I mean, they haven't said that much, but I believe it relates to the cost because we had a proposal um, under the dispute settlement chapter that there should be a legal fund established from which the Pacific Island countries can draw funds to, and Australia and New Zealand uh, shut it down. Well, because they said, well, look, we are prepared to provide you with the resources to build your capacity but we don't want to create the perverse situation where we would fund you to challenge us or to challenge our laws. And they also said that, well, look, from a political standpoint, it would be very difficult for them 
to challenge, bring a case against a Pacific Island country. So in as much as we do have a dispute settlement chapter, Australia and New Zealand prefer that there should be good offices, mediation, and you know, that should be the first thing. And if with time, then it should come to arbitration. But I think one of the things that we have witnessed, and I think which is quite good, is that I think the engagement, and already I'm trying to get Gary to come to New Zealand. Um, we are going to meet in Christchurch, all the lawyers from the Pacific Island countries, because as compared to the Caribbean, I think the Caribbean has done you know, phenomenal. I think by understanding that there is a model law, we do not have that in the Pacific. Um, as well, there are very few signatories to the New York Convention, and I think all of them realize the need for that. But it is not, um, I think, as I said, it's a death of information, but they would like to basically um, adopt the New York Convention. Mo most of them will have expressed uh, um, an interest in becoming signatories, and also for more information about you know, commercial arbitration. For example, if you look, for example, um, Papua New Guinea, which, at least as far as other Pacific Island countries is concerned, is a capital exporting country um, you know, in the financial services sector. Recently, the Bank of South Pacific, which is headquartered in Papua New Guinea, bought the Westpac Australian Bank operations in the Pacific Island countries. So they have that investment. They also have hotels. So what is quite striking is that Papua New Guinea, in its, it has given, for example, Solomon, Solomon Islands, a proposed BIT, and it wants arbitration, which we don't have in PESA Plus with Australia and New Zealand. Normally, it should be the contrary. You would find that the developed countries would, t technically speaking, insist on international arbitration. But in the context of PESA Plus, Australia and New Zealand haven't insisted on international arbitration. Actually, what we have, the default, is that in the event of a dispute between a foreign investor and the host country, recourse to domestic courts. But in the context of agreements which Papua New Guinea is proposing to sign with other MSG countries, it wants international arbitration, exit, or in situ. So you find the, the disconnect that you find, you know, obviously for Papua New Guinea being a capital exporting country, it would like to protect its investors. So I think this points to a trend that in the Pacific, I think eventually um, arbitration, not only for investor state disputes, but also for commercial transactions. As the economies become more integrated, I think the need for arbitration would increase. But currently, intra-trade is so low, and I think that is why you know, there hasn't been the demand for international arbitration. And I think that is true for most jurisdictions. As countries deepen trade and investment, then you find that recourse to arbitration increases. But if you have very shallow integration and the level of intra-trade is very small as well as investment, then you find that you know, the, the recourse to arbitration or ADR will be limited. And I think that is what is happening. But I think going forward, if we were to have the PESA Plus agreement, which I believe would increase trade and investment between the Pacific Island countries and Australia and New Zealand, then clearly I think the next step would be to have uh, provisions on arbitration. We have, Australia initially had tabled the proposal, uh, sorry, New Zealand had tabled the proposal, but then um, Australia and the Pacific Island countries thought it was too soon because most of the Pacific Island countries, I think, apart from um, um, Tong uh, Fiji even doesn't have a BIT. It is Tonga, um, Vanuatu, and Papua New Guinea. They are signatories, and I think Papua New Guinea as was um, stated, they have five, and I think Vanuatu one or two, and Tonga one or two. So most of the countries, out of the 14, only three have some sort of expertise with international arbitration. So I think that accounts for the low, um, the, the reason why most of the countries, some of them had not even heard about the New York Convention until Gary addressed them in Tonga. So, and they have put in a request that there should be a follow-up seminar and you know, we, we want to try to get everybody together. And I think from there, um, maybe we could assist the countries build their capacity. They do see the need because currently if there is a dispute, as our colleague said, it is more the domestic court. And you know, because of the backlog, the lack of expertise, it is very difficult for disputes to be settled promptly. You know, if you have a court which has a backlog of about 10,000 cases, then, and very few people like Vanuatu, where I currently live, if they have cases, they fly in 
um, you know, the judges from Australia, from New Zealand, and that adds <coughs> to the cost. So, you know, we are talking about saving, you know, maybe arbitration may be too expensive. But already the countries are also, you know, bearing the cost by flying in judges from New Zealand. I guess that may be more expensive, actually. So, um, basically, I think arbitration, well, I would like to say there is the promise for arbitration in the Pacific. And I think as the countries develop, there is more intra-trade than I think they would embrace arbitration. So I'll just end here. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Jack, we cut you short. If there was three minutes you wanted to add, no, I, no, no, I no, apologize no, no. for doing that. No, no. I'll do one minute. Three, three minutes, okay. I've got, I've got, uh, the tribunal gives you three minutes. <laughs> this goes beyond the bat, and this is the, this is the technology part. Okay. This makes lawyers nervous sometimes. Here's some other applications of technology beyond the bat, and I'll just hit you with three, three examples. One is dispute resolution by algorithm. The second is the robot arbitrator. And the third is drafting an arbitration agreement without directly using lawyers. Um, some of you, anybody heard of Modria? Yeah. Okay, so Modria, Modria built its business uh, on the eBay dispute resolution model. In fact, the people, the, the CEO was at eBay, um, and and they largely have focused on consumer disputes, but they are moving to business to business arbitration. The idea being if you can consensually through an algorithm resolve 70 or 80 percent of the disputes, then spend the money on the rest and your average cost And goes if you think down. of this as just some newfangled thing, they're actually dealing with right. tens, hundreds of thousands of disputes as we speak. Exactly. Yeah. But most of them are B2C, but they're moving it. They're, they're, yeah. It's becoming B2B. Um, just recently, I think it was last week, um, the uh, uh, the, the lawyer Ross, which is the, the version of Watson that practices law and that is being developed by Next Law Labs, which is part of Denton's, or at least was started by Denton's, uh, has hired, it's been hired by its first official law firm. It's no two different, of two, two of them now. And in fact, some of you may be aware that there's a robot board member on a venture capital firm in Hong Kong. That was a couple of years ago. The point is that intelligent, in, in artificial intelligence can sometimes provide insights that we miss. And then the last thing, example, has anybody seen the AAA clause builder? It, it essentially is a build it yourself arbitration provision, which Gary, a lot of people have talked about patholo pathological arbitration clauses, the way you avoid those, because if the machine is set up right, it won't draft a pathological clause. <laughs> you, a lot of human lawyers will. This one is AAA. I'm actually, this is a project I'm working on. This last spring, I taught a course. I'm teaching law students to write drag and drop object-based code that essentially allows you to automate certain legal tasks that you don't really need a lawyer for. Again, you drive down the costs. You make the best lawyers more productive. The one I'm working on is a multi-institutional clause drafter like AAA, but depending on the person's answers in the automated interview, what do you want? Do you favor confidentiality? Do you, you know, what do you favor? Um, pick and choose uh, from the uh, various attributes of, of different sets of arbitration rules and essentially says, here are a couple of institutions that might be suitable for you. Which one would you like? And drafts a clause. I'm using the Neodologic platform because that's the one I teach on. But this is the sort of thing that, again, for the small business with an unsophisticated lawyer, whether this is lawyer facing or client facing, this is the sort of thing that makes not just default arbitration, but tailored arbitration available to the small business. So again, my current niche that I love to talk about is technology leveraging, leveraged lawyering that provides greater access to justice, whether it be for people of modest means or small businesses. Thanks thank you, for letting thank me you very much, Jack. Thank you. <laughs> Patrick, did you want to intercede here for two minutes, or did you want to leave that I till just later? Wanted to, well, I wanted to do one footnote, if I'm allowed to abuse my position, to Jack. Not abusing it. I just <laughs> want to know how long it'll take. Not long. <laughs> <laughs> to Jack's uh, presentation. And just to let everybody know, and the New Zealanders in the room have heard this now more than once, but we actually did on the back of the bat, the first um, pilot of empirical research by um, interviewing small and medium-sized businesses in New Zealand to actually get a real sense of how do they actually conduct contracts. Um, if you talk with the big law firms, they will tell you, oh, they all have their 
a dispute resolution clause is not a problem. So our empirical research in New Zealand very clearly shows that they're not even thinking. As what Jack says is even too kind. Yeah? So the typical answer even is, oh, maybe, maybe I have a claim. Yeah? Maybe I can go to the court to New Zealand, but even thinking about that hurts my head. That's it's a direct <laughs> quote from one of the business owners. Um, so the other direct quote would be, when they're using lawyers, and that's, that's a, I mean, New Zealand isn't even a small state with one and a half million in the GDP it's half, but to access lawyers in New Zealand, you would need to go to the really three, four, five, six big law firms to get advice in regard to cross-border dispute resolution. One of the business owners of an SME said, well, even if I would go to my lawyer, he would know what, what I was or he would talk about. Yeah, this is a small town lawyer in New Zealand. They have no idea about cross-border dis dispute resolution. Some so do. Some, some do. Some do they, are, they are very rare. Very rare. So what I'm just saying is, so following on from Jack, I think there is a real need to think this further, and the real question becomes, in the end, is what's the best, better default? Cross-border litigation or cross-border arbitration, and the moment you can, I think, have the empirical evidence that cross-border arbitration is a better and more cost-effective one and will, in the end, also encourage SMEs to trade more, and there is evidence about that already, I think then we might see a shift in states to be very amicable to doing mats or bets. Okay, thank you.